should the beaches be closed? The airline industry under fire. ABC News learning the Justice Department investigating major airlines. Did they work together to illegally drive up prices? Deadly storms, tornadoes reported from North Dakota to Pennsylvania. 18 million facing extreme weather. The wildfires in the West, the record heat. Ginger Z with the holiday forecast. And mind games. Hope Solo's revealing admission, how she psyched out her opponent to help Team USA into the World Cup final. From ABC News World Headquarters, this is ABC World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening and great to have you with us on this Wednesday night. I'm Amy Robach in for David Muir and we begin with what is shaping up to be the summer of the shark along one stretch of Atlantic Ocean shore. A new attack in North Carolina today and on the map you can see the cluster of seven attacks the latest in Ocracoke on the Outer Banks and as we head into the biggest beach weekend of the year every one of those spots expected to be crowded with swimmers. Here's ABC's Matt Gutman. Tonight, another victim airlifted after a mauling at sea. Officials saying a man in his 60s attacked by a shark, believed to be as long as a surfboard, all while swimming in waist-deep water, his hip, leg, and hands injured. It's the seventh attack in the last three weeks on North Carolina shores, including two children, a boy and a girl, each losing limbs in separate incidents last month. When I saw him, his arms went up, the shark took his left arm and he just took off running is this real and started screaming is this real all of a sudden i saw a fin over the weekend patrick thornton felt a similar set of jaws it took a big pretty big chunk out of my right legs he was also in waist deep water but decided to fight back so i started punching the shark and then it grabbed the, my back must have bit me in the back. When he saw his eight-year-old son frozen with fear in the shallows. I ran over and, and grabbed Jack, and as I was bringing him to the shore, the shark came and, and bit me again in the back. And this time, um, he bit me really, really hard. Tonight, these beaches remain open. We asked the governor if he'd order them closed, but his office tells ABC News it's up to the various local officials to decide. So far, no decision to close the beaches. Experts advise to do whatever you can to fight back. Yep, you're gonna strike them. All right. Quick, fast, punch down. And given all the people expected in the Carolinas for the 4th of July weekend, Amy, shark experts tell us expect another victim. Now, what can you do to protect yourself? Avoid wearing anything reflective. Stay in shallow water and above all, avoid these jetties and piers. Fishermen use bait and bait attract sharks. Amy. All right, good advice there, Matt. Thanks so much. And next to the airlines under investigation, the government asking, are they working together to drive up airfares? These four airlines, American, Delta, Southwest, and United, together control 80% of the seats on U.S. flights. Anyone who has flown lately knows about high fares and added fees, as well as crowded and uncomfortable cabins. With more than 3 million Americans expected to fly this holiday weekend, will they be paying more than they should? ABC's David Curley, who covers aviation for us with details on the investigation. Planes are packed, but is that because airlines are working together illegally to keep fares that you pay higher? Tonight, the Justice Department saying it's investigating potential unlawful coordination by certain airlines after a call for an investigation by a U.S. Senator. Holding down supply, economics 101, that is a violation of law if it is misuse of market power. United, Delta, American and Southwest, which together control 80% of the market, have been told to produce statements and decisions from the past two years about the size of their fleets. The theory is that the airlines may have been working together to keep those fleets the same size so that the airlines could keep fares up. The airlines, through their associations, say they compete vigorously every day. If the definition of collusion is that the airline executives are calling each other up and saying what they're doing, you know, the next day with their businesses, there's no smoking gun there. David Curley joining us now. And David, any sense of how long this investigation will take? Well, Senator Blumenthal, who called for the investigation, is also calling 
on the Department of Justice to move quickly because we're in the midst of this busy summer travel season. He wants relief for consumers as soon as possible, Amy. All right, David, thanks so much. And now to severe weather coast to coast, from tornadoes to flash floods to strong winds and record heat, millions touched by it, at least two people killed. Lightning from one side of the sky to the other in this composite image from Silver Spring, Maryland. A New Jersey woman killed by a falling tree as she walked to her car this morning. And the searing heat in the west compounding the fire danger there. Six states battling the flames tonight. ABC's chief meteorologist Ginger Z with it all. Holy smoke. Debris flying in North Dakota. A tornado ripping through this farmhouse. Unbelievable. Storm chasers right there capturing the rotation from bottom to top. That tornado, one of more than 350 severe storm reports in just the past 36 hours, from a confirmed EF1 tornado in eastern Pennsylvania to drenching rains on the commute in North Carolina. Deadly flash floods in Syracuse, New York. One man trying to push cars out, falling through a manhole. Torrential rain in New Jersey with winds up to 65 miles per hour. In Maine, a drone used to rescue this 12-year-old boy and another teen after they were stranded by raging rivers. And with all the severe storms, an epic lightning show. Look at this picture from Washington, D.C., where the First Lady's first White House campout was a washout. Significant flash flooding from Texas to Nevada to Louisiana. And then west of the Rockies, Las Vegas to Washington State still baking with the fire danger on high. After two dozen homes in Wenatchee, Washington burned this week, officials announcing a ban on fireworks. And Ginger is here. And Ginger, the Midwest and the Southeast with the worst of it tonight? Tonight for the severe weather. Let's get right to the map. The severe thunderstorm watch has been reduced, but still in North Georgia, something to watch for. And overnight, more storms from Missouri through Kentucky, places that have had their rivers at crest or higher, going to see it again. So it's along that stationary front that we'll see the area of severe weather risk expand tomorrow. Anywhere from the Oklahoma and Texas panhandles through Oklahoma City, Little Rock's in there, Nashville to Atlanta, you could see the large hail, damaging wind, and yes, an isolated tornado. We popped out the four states we're most concerned about heat, Nevada, California, Oregon, and Washington State. Excessive heat warnings in the Sacramento Valley. You wonder, why has this been happening? So hot out west, so cool and stormy in the east. It is the jet stream and that upper level ridge, Amy, back out west. It looks like it sticks for another six to ten days at least. All right, blame it on the jet stream. Yes. All right, Ginger, thank you. Well, tonight, a fire in a historic black church in South Carolina is touching a nerve. The Mount Zion AME Church in flames last night. A terrible sight against the dark sky. And after the sun came up, only the shell left standing. Investigators suspect it was lightning, not racism, that sparked the fire. But this church was destroyed once before by the Ku Klux Klan. ABC Steve Osinsami there tonight. Tonight, law enforcement sources tell us they don't believe it was an act of hate that burned this black church to the ground. Instead, an act of God. Early reports suggest it was lightning from storms last night that burned the Mount Zion AME Church in rural South Carolina. It's the second devastating fire here, the last one set by two white supremacists 20 years ago. When you see this church, what does it do to your heart this morning? It rips my heart into pieces. Families who grew up in the church say they're still suspicious, with seven recent fires at black churches across the South. At least two of them were set on purpose. This may be from lightning, but I know out of the seven churches, it's not all lightning. Every one of the seven fires has come after the racially motivated attack at the AME Emanuel Church in Charleston. I'm praying for you. This is my hometown too. Okay? Tammy Irwin came here today to let them know that white families in the community are praying for them too. I hope it meant something to her because not everybody's ugly. We're learning that fires at churches and religious institutions are a lot more common in this country than you might think. An average of 400 each year. Families at black churches in particular tonight are keeping an eye out. Amy. All right, Steve, thank you. And from England tonight, a somber return home for victims of the terror attack in Tunisia. The bodies of eight British citizens who died at that beach resort arriving at a military base in a solemn ceremony. More than two dozen victims still to come 
Also tonight, ISIS taking credit for 15 simultaneous attacks in Egypt that killed at least 62 soldiers. The wave of violence prompting a strong warning from the U.S. Defense Secretary about security here at home. Here's ABC's chief investigative correspondent, Brian Ross. In the wake of a series of deadly ISIS attacks on a beach in Tunisia and today in Egypt, the American intelligence community tonight is on an urgent search for any sign of ISIS followers plotting a July 4th attack in the U.S., looking especially closely at social media sites. There are self-radicalized, self-organized people on social media. Are we concerned about that? Absolutely, we're, we're concerned about it. And authorities say the social media sites are not doing all they can to help. The man who led the attack on the Mohammed cartoon contest in Texas was in open communication on Twitter with a known ISIS recruiter who posted this. It's time for brothers in the U.S. to do their part. Yet while social media companies say they aggressively act to stop such traffic, most don't have a policy to routinely notify authorities about it. The law says if social media are aware of child pornography, they have to tell police authorities. But they have no such obligation if they're aware of terrorism or terrorist plots. As British authorities discovered two years ago when two jihadists beheaded a soldier on a London street. Before the attack, one of them had posted a message reportedly on Facebook, let's kill a soldier, and his account was canceled. But authorities were not alerted by Facebook until after the murder. And Brian Ross with us tonight. Washington now turning up the heat on some of these social networks. That's right, Amy. The Senate Intelligence Committee has now approved a bill to require sites to notify authorities about possible terrorist activities. Civil liberties groups warn that could turn social media into secret police. Uh, today, Twitter did not respond to our questions, and Facebook says it works with law enforcement when it believes there's a genuine risk to public safety, but authorities say that is still not good enough, Amy. All right, Brian, thank you. And tonight, Cuba and the United States taking a step closer, about to reopen embassies in each other's capitals. Families in Havana watching President Obama's announcement carried live on Cuban TV. ABC senior national correspondent Jim Avila, who broke the news of the diplomatic breakthrough in December with the new details tonight. Jim. Amy, here at the once and now future home of the Cuban embassy, they're ready to raise the flag on the newly installed flag pole. The ambassador showing us the folded flag ready to be hoisted over the refurbished site the week of July 20th when diplomatic relations are officially resumed. In Havana, along the famous Malacón, the American embassy has been spruced up as well for its reopening this month. Both presidents saying today that there are many issues still to be resolved, but now diplomats are free to travel nationwide and meet with the people. Amy? All right, Jim, thank you so much. Well, big changes are coming to the New York State prison that allowed those two convicted killers to escape. A new superintendent has now been put in charge to implement new security measures. Among them, weekly inspections of cell walls, random bed checks, gates inside the tunnels, and shutting down the honor block where inmates like Sweat and Matt could cook and visit each other's cells. Next to a terrifying close call for two teenagers home alone when thieves broke into their home. The girls immediately called 911 and then hid in a bathroom where they stayed on the line until police walked into that bathroom and rescued them. ABC's Ryan Owens with the drama playing out on that 911 tape. They're loud. Please hurry. The 16-year-old girl is calling 911 stuffed inside her parents' bathroom linen closet. Her 13-year-old sister snuggled right next to her. We're in the very back with my parents' bedroom bathroom. Please hurry. The two sisters were home alone Monday morning when they looked out the kitchen window and noticed two men trying to break into their Nashville, Tennessee home. They're in the house. Are they in the house? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I want you to be very quiet, okay? I'm on the line with you. I have help on the way. The FBI says burglaries happen in this country every 15 seconds, and more than a quarter of the time, somebody's home. They're getting closer. They're getting closer to the bathroom? With the help of the sisters, Nashville police arrested these two men, both with lengthy criminal records. The sisters also walked officers right to their most unusual hiding spot. Okay, we're here. We're back here. A tiny bathroom closet barely big enough to hold these two teenagers, braver than many adults. Ryan Owens, ABC News, Dallas. Oh.
So glad they are okay. Ryan, thank you for that. And a lucky break for a California woman trapped for two days in a canyon when her car went off the road. Her family reported her missing on Monday, but it took a jogger on her morning run who heard her cries today to save her life. ABC's Kendis Gibson with more. The dramatic rescue unfolding on the steep...